Last week, we began a sermon series that I titled Trust in a Broken World. How many of you look at your world right now and it feels pretty broken? Yeah? Well, the truth of it is, is at this particular point, it really seems like it is. It seems like when we look around us, there is brokenness everywhere. But I want to remind you this morning that in the midst of that brokenness, God is still on the throne. God is still doing business with people. God is still victorious over Satan. What we are seeing may be a broken world, but we're going to receive a heaven that is the total opposite of all of this. And so we can look forward in hope, but realize so long as we are here, we still have the benefit of eternal life, which is God the Holy Spirit alive and working in us. And so that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about this morning. Last week, it was trust in uncertainty. Remember, we left the disciples staring at the sky, going, what did we just see? And what are we now supposed to do? We'll pick it up this week with the idea of trust the empowerment. You see, as the disciples were sitting there and they were staring at the sky, after Jesus had just been with them, they could reach out, they could touch him, they could be Jesus, it's so nice to see you. And then all of a sudden, whoop, he's up to heaven. The disciples are looking up at heaven. They stare there long enough that God sends two angels. And he says to those, or through those angels, men of Galilee, remember, he identifies them. He says, what are you doing staring at the sky? This was a nice way of saying, boys, we have a problem. And then he tells them their future. And in telling them their future, he is reminding them of what Jesus said for them. You've got to go back, bring the church together, because your better days are ahead, not behind. Amen? That's still true for us today. Our better days are ahead, not behind. Why? Because of the same thing that applied for the disciples. They had received from Jesus in those 40 days all of what they needed to succeed. Salvation had been paid for. Jesus spent 40 days intimately talking to the disciples. And then he says, you will receive power. This is Acts 1.8. When the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. And so now we see disciples who are battle ready. They've received this training. Now they're told, go back to where we began and wait for the commencement. Because everything will be in full given to you when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the disciples had to make a choice, right? They had to go from to, okay. They had to go back to Jerusalem. They had to meet daily. Now, some people are of the opinion that that upper room where Jesus had them meet for the Last Supper continued to be the place where they met for the next 90 days. I want to show you that's probably not the case. Remember, the scripture gives us a very clear picture when it says, and they went to the temple daily to pray. There was one place in the temple that could accommodate, they say, as many as 50,000 people could be in this one part of the temple itself. It was a place called Solomon's Colonnade. Solomon's Colonnade. So if you picture that in your church, you could sit 50,000 people, I'm sure 120 could kind of find a spot where they would more or less be left alone and they could pray. Let me show you this just for a moment. Do you see the walls that went all the way around the temple? The front wall of that was Solomon's colonnade. So this was the spot that basically everybody had to come through, but it was the spot where the disciples and the rest of the 120 would have gathered to pray. It might have looked something like this. So the disciples and all of them are gathering to pray, 
And in Acts chapter 2, we see the result of their prayer. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly the sound of a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were seated. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So they go from meeting together in unity to one day, this big, huge sound of a wind comes. Fire comes down from heaven. It separates and rests on each individual head. And these people start to speak in tongues that nobody knew what they were talking about until they did. Until they did. You see, there were people from all over the world that were worshiping in Jerusalem at that time. And so if you picture that this is where the disciples were located and people are filtering it and filtering out like a big foyer in a church, then people are hearing what's going on. Perhaps they're even seeing what's going on. And as they hear and as they see it, they're interested. And this big gathering begins to happen around the disciples. Here's where it gets even cooler. These things that the disciples were speaking, these tongues that they were given, apparently they were earthly languages that were given to the disciples because people from all over the world are going, what did Sheila just say? That's my native tongue. What did Katie just say? That's my native tongue. And they're hearing the praises of God expressed by people who were considered the uneducated of the uneducated. That was Galileans. They were fishermen. All they had time to do was fish, stink, and tell stories. You following me on this? So these people are overwhelmingly interested in what's happening to the disciples. And as you saw in the children's moment, it says that Peter, he kind of finds himself in a position where he is now talking to everyone gathered. And it must have been a pretty significant number because it said 3,000 people came into the church in that day. He says this, Acts chapter 2, 16 through 21. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Joel, thousands of years ago. Keep that in mind. It shall come to pass in the last days, said God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapors of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood, and the great and notable day of the Lord shall come. And it shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved." What on the world are we seeing? We are seeing the death of one age and the birth of a new age in how God is intervening with man. This new age in which God is intervening with man, Frank Schofield called a dispensation. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Schofield Reference Bible, but he was a person who believed in dispensations. There are seven dispensations. Presently, right now, we are living in the sixth. It's the dispensation of grace. In this dispensation, God chooses to work with us very differently than he chose to work for generations. And in the next dispensation, he'll work even a little bit differently as he brings to an end this world and brings to birth the world to come. In this thing, in this, in this proclamation, what Joel said, this prophecy, this baptism of the Holy Spirit was the beginning of something wonderful, but it was also a sign of the end to come. That's why you see the, the moon turning to blood and, and smoke and fire and all these things. That is a picture of the revelation. And so if we bring all this stuff together, what we see happening different in this dispensation of grace is that God is choosing to work differently with us because he is no longer God up there or God out there. He is now God in here. He is now God in us 
And so now Christians have a completely different role than they have had at any time previous. Christians have the role of conveying the presence of God to the people all around them, which means plainly we are to be his hands and feet. So you're to be hands and feet, Aaron. What does that mean? I'm not Jesus. I can't be like Jesus. You're right. You can't. You can be better, better than Jesus. Listen to what the Bible itself says. Truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the work that I have been doing. And they will do even what? What's it say? Greater Greater things. Say that again. Greater things. This is Jesus who is saying greater things than what I am doing, you will do because I'm going to my father. And oh yeah, by the way, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. Jesus healed the sick, raised the dead, walked on water, caused the blind to see, cast out demons. It's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Do you know the disciples did all those things? And more? So either Jesus told the truth that greater things you will do, or he lied, but we can't even prove he lied because we can see in his own disciples Peter walked by people. His shadow fell on them and they were healed. Peter was the first one to send out holy handkerchiefs and people would take these and they would be healed. Now, I've never walked on water. As you can probably tell, I sink. I've never sent out holy hankies because that's gross. Um, But this stuff was all done by the leading of God's Holy Spirit, and it changed and transformed lives. So the disciples proved what Jesus was saying, that if you receive the Holy Spirit, you can do all that Jesus did and more. Now, here's where it gets fun. Everybody say, this is fun. It's fun, right, Dylan? Right. One day. So we are promised the same Holy Spirit that falls on the disciples, that radically transforms the way the disciples do ministry. We are promised the baptism. Now, in the Free Methodist Church, we have this tendency of talking in terms more along the line of what we call an entire sanctification experience. For those of you who have been in the Free Methodist Church a long time, we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Please don't misinterpret what I'm saying. But we believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the spark which leads us into entire sanctification. What entire sanctification is not? Number one, it is not sinless perfection. Let me promise you something. You will sin a lot until you sin less, until you die where you will sin no more. So the picture here is, is that by having this baptism in the Holy Spirit experience where Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit in a work post-salvation to come into you to to fulfill the ministry Jesus sent him to do, he will ultimately make you less of a sinner and more like Jesus. Let me share with you again, it is not a one-time infilling. You don't get the baptism and then get to go, hallelujah, I got the baptism and I'm good for life. No, you need an infilling of the Holy Spirit on a consistent basis. Now, you don't get the baptism and then get a patch that you can wear on your sash that says, I got the baptism. And then you get to look at everybody who doesn't have it and go, I am better than you are. That's not how it works either. And I would also say that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not revealed or manifested by simply one manifestation, but many. So let me tell you what this baptism is here very quickly. Number one, it is the igniting point to a process, a process that breaks itself down in three different ways. 
Number one, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is a spark for you to become more holy. More holy doesn't mean that you wear your tie on Sunday morning, comb your hair to the right, shine your shoes, and measure your hemline. And I'm just talking about the guys. (laughs) Holiness is about listening to the Lord and doing what he says. So if he says to you, this isn't really good for you, then guess what? When you don't do it, you become more holy. If he says it to you on consecutive issues, that means you're becoming less for self and more for Christ. That is what the baptism of the Holy Spirit sparks to make you more holy. Secondly, it begins a process for ministry. Now, let me step on everybody's toes at one time so that we can get over this. Your goal before God is not to sit in the pew every Sunday. That's a part of what you do, but that is certainly not the end. The end is to be his hands and his feet to the world around you. Fathers and mothers in your homes, everyone who has a job in your workplaces, teachers in your schools, children in your schools, children with your brothers, with your sisters. I don't know, all the boys are like, oh, even them? Yeah. We are to do ministry, not because it's one more program in church. We are to do ministry because of what Jesus has done in us. And we receive this empowerment from the Holy Spirit. And it's not so we can sit there and go, oh, I got the holy heebie-jeebies. It's really all about fuel for where God wants you to go. And then the third part of this is this is a process that ignites a new intimacy between you and your God. We have a lot of people in our world that know a lot about Jesus. You can go to Ivy League colleges and you can talk to professors of religion. And those professors of religion can probably go full circle around eight out of 10 preachers in the pulpit today. But as you listen to them talk, many times what you're going to hear is the academic knowledge of God without the heart change. They had a term for that in the scripture. They called them Pharisees. And too many times people are going to Pharisees when they need to see people who truly love Jesus. Again, not because you have to, but because it's all you can do. When you brought children into this world, mom, did you hold up that little baby and go, I have to love this thing? Right? No. You did it because you wanted to. It's the same sort of picture. When you receive this baptism of the Holy Spirit experience, He will start a spark in you that will teach you to love Jesus, not because of heaven or hell, but because you want to. See, all of these things are interwoven through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus promised the apostles. This empowerment, the Greek word is dunamis. We get our word dynamite. And what does dynamite do? It has landscape, life-altering power. Can I tell you one of the saddest things I think I've ever seen and, and experienced on my own end, in my own life, is powerless Christianity. I think it's sad. I hear people talking and they say things like, well, nothing will ever change. He'll never change. She'll never change. Uh, If you have landscape altering power, start speaking the change. Start proclaiming what is going to come, not because you, but because Christ has given you the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is alive in you and he cares about what you care about. And so he wants to change the things that need changed. Your promised power. This power is going to manifest itself in two powerful applications. Three minutes and we're done. First, you'll have a power to witness. 
As I said, that person who you think, there is no way he is the meanest person in the world. world. He, he, he yells at kids who aren't even on his lawn just to practice for yelling at the ones when they show up. He's just that guy. God can change his life. I remember a story. His name was Doug. He was a Navy midshipman for 30 years, and he was the meanest guy I ever met in my life. Until at 83 years old, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And I remember Doug, a year before he died, he stood in the front row as I led worship. He put both hands up to heaven and he wept like a child. And I have to tell you, that will go down in my mind as one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Because one more example, it was one more example about what the power of God can do. See, the reason why is this, and I love this saying, the Holy Spirit is an artist who paints a picture that someone wants to buy. Even the meanest, the furthest lost, the nastiest, the, 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 I'll just, you fill in the rest of the adjectives here. These people have something they want that God can fill. And so the Holy Spirit will be the artist, but you bring the brush and you're useful to the Lord. But with this idea of the power to live, so going back to this for a minute, you're given the power to witness, but secondly, you're given the power to live. We have a superintendent in the Free Methodist Church. His name is Mark Adams, and he wrote this about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. He said, we Free Methodists believe that God expects and empowers those who will turn to God, either to repent of wrongdoing or to embrace a more beautiful and true life or any combination thereof to be, hear this, all in with Jesus radically devoted to God, refusing compromise with the world, full of the Holy Spirit, wholly available for God's purposes, settling for nothing less than everything God has for them, not holding back on anything that hinders God's work through us, and finally, sacrificing anything to be everything God intends us to be. John Wesley said, when I think of Christian perfection, it's nothing other than love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. I have two questions for you as we close. Question number one is this. Do you